Hi folks, it's Kevin here again. Nice to be out again on the trail. Okay, today I'm in a place called Kareva and I'm on an 11 kilometer route or loop, better said, called the Karavan Kierto or literally in English Karavan, Karava Loop. Uh, the area goes through swamp and I do a little quick spin. Uh, you can see that there's small lakes. The northern part of the trail is dotted with these small lakes, which are actually sand pits. They're man-made. Um, at the moment, as you can see, they are frozen, and uh, there's a very light covering of snow on the trail. So in winter, it's these trails are very popular with people to go cross-country skiing and hiking, obviously. And I found this trail on the All Trails app. I can put a link to the trail itself in the description below. Uh, the trail area is very popular, especially, especially this part with the small lakes, uh, because it's uh, primarily sand around here. So the lakes form nice natural beaches. Uh, and there are so many lakes and as it is a popular place in summer for people to come and swim, uh, it's affectionately known locally as the Moscow Riviera. Okay, I just made a couple of wrong turns since I last made a vlog entry. The trail here isn't terribly well marked, although I now realize that there are orange markers on the trees that I have to follow in place of actual signs telling me which way to go. So, uh, I had initially planned to do the whole thing uh, anti-clockwise and I took a wrong turn and now it seems I'm going to be doing the walk clockwise. Oh well, such is life. I just now passed a sign and uh, I don't know if you can read that, it says Karavan Suo and Kareva is the name of the area and Suo is a swamp in Finnish and it's thought that possibly the Finnish name for Finland, Suomi, uh, has the same root. So basically it's a swampy place or swampy land. The presence of duck birds here tells me that this is the start of the swamp of this area called Karavan Suo. And duck boards are to help you to keep your feet dry when walking through the swamp area. Um, another giveaway is the actual vegetation itself uh, primarily being I'm not sure if you can see this it's because it may be a bit dim but there's this green of course it's withered also at the moment uh, green plant and it's called suoporso in Finnish I'll have to check what, then, what it is in in English but uh, it has this lovely sweet smell and um, in summer uh, it blankets the entire uh, ground. Um, it used to be used in the old days for flavoring beer and give it a sweet taste. But uh, yeah, it has a lovely sort of forest sweet smell. It reminds me a little bit of bog myrtle. So something like this could be put in your boots to keep your feet nice and fresh smelling. Yeah, another feature of swamp area in Finland is that, as you can see, the dominant tree here is Scots pine. Uh, but interestingly, they're all quite short and stubby. None of them are growing particularly tall. They're not many much beyond five, six meters tall, and most are smaller. Uh, this is typical of swampy areas where the trees have stunted growth. The other place to see this kind of feature is in the very far north of Lapland or in high altitudes where uh, the more extremes of cold will cause the trees to grow smaller. I said before that the Finnish word for a swamp is Suo. However, much like the Inuit peoples of Greenland and Canada who are supposed to have like 200 words for snow, the Finns have at least 50 words for swamps depending on whether they are wet, dry, drained, have trees in, don't have trees in, have low-lying vegetation, don't like, don't have low-lying vegetation, etc. So 
Uh, Swa is one, Numi is another, another would be Reme, and so on and so on. So, uh, as I was walking here, there were lots and lots of footprints in the snow, and eventually they thinned out until there, for a while, there was just one set of footprints ahead of me. And I wondered if I'd meet the owner. But uh, for the last while now, there's just been no tracks, so it looks like I'm on my own. So, here's a bit of Geology 101. I'm standing on a smooth face of granite rock, pink granite, much like you find in uh, Connemara. And uh, I don't know if you'd see that, but you've got different fault lines in the rock, which is normal. Then you've got these rub marks that run all in one direction, and they continue. They all run basically in this orientation. So that tells me that this flat granite has been polished smooth by a glacier flowing over it, carrying stones and rocks. And as the rocks have basically been ground over the surface of the granite, it's left these scratch marks, which tells you which way the actual ice was traveling at the time. These scratch marks are known as striations or striations, uh, sometimes also known as striae. Right, well, the tent is now set up and it's getting dark. It's not full dark yet, but I think I'll put some food on. So today we have something to eat, beef stew with potatoes. So let's see how that works out. Okay, so the food is ready, and uh, I must have left it in there for at least 10 minutes, but still piping hot. Looks quite good, it's puffed up nicely. So, okay, I guess the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Mmm. <clears throat> just a job, just what I need it. Well, good morning, folks. Yeah, it's cold one this morning, it's about minus five. Uh, sunny and frosty, so it's going to be a nice hike later on. I slept quite well on and off though because the motorway isn't too far away it was, it was kind of I could hear the traffic and uh, I'm not sure if you can pick this up in the audio but just over there maybe about 400 meters away is the clearly very clearly a, a gravel quarry and they've had some sort of shaker machines going on this morning that they use presumably for grading the grading the gravel so it stops every now and again and it goes relatively quiet. And then they also fill it up with more stuff and then they get it going again. So yeah, it's it's quite loud, but it doesn't matter. The place is beautiful. Yeah, it turned out it was uh, quite a clear night last night and it turned really frosty. You could see all the stars and uh, the moon was out nice and clear. So one thing that's rather interesting that shows me how effective a tent can be in um, protecting the camper is that I have two water bottles here. Um, this one was in the vestibule. This one was on the vestibule side, but right beside the, uh, like on the inside of the tent. And uh, yeah, apart from a little bit of ice crystals, it's almost uh, it's almost completely okay. So you know, I can actually use it in the morning. I'm not getting much out of this. So, so it's quite impressive how a few millimeters of effectively nylon and some some heat provided by a body it can make all the difference there was quite a lot of condensation in the tent last night but that's not really surprising considering I was in it for over 12 hours so um, I'm not too concerned too much about that uh, although it is a bit unpleasant when you're 
peacefully sleeping and uh, you get very cold drops uh, dropping on your face or into your eyes but all part of the fun of camping at this time of the year I get. Yeah so last night I had my Arab Ascent 900 sleeping bag, the Cedar Summit Reactor Light sleeping bag liner and I put hot water just before going to bed into a metal drinking bottle also to keep me warm as well as putting my clothes inside the inside the sleeping bag. As to the ladder, it was quite nice putting on warm clothes this morning, straight out of the sleeping bag. Although it's a bit of a wiggle and a shimmy to try and get them on in the Cairngorm 100 because it's, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of space inside. For the most part I was warm, for the most part I was warm. I still kept getting cold spots over my lower back no matter which way I turned, which was a bit frustrating because, I mean, at most it was minus 5, minus 6 last night and the sleeping bag traded for minus 18. So I'm a bit concerned that I see reviews people, of people saying that they're really snug and actually too hot using this bag, you know, in, in sub-zero temperatures and I'm like, that's not my experience at all. So uh, I need to maybe do some research online to see if I'm actually using it, not using it correctly. So I don't know. But looking at it optimistically, I got plenty of sleep. I mean, I went into the tent last night at around 7 p.m. and I crawled out finally this morning at about half past nine. So, yeah, I spent a long time in the tent last night, uh, apart from having to get up for pee breaks. So, overall, I'm very happy. Okay, all packed up and ready to go. Just do a quick last check. No rubbish or anything left behind. No, all good. Okay, well, thank you, Forrest, for hosting me for the night. Let's get back on the trail. Yeah, it's a gorgeous morning. Nice to have a, a day of sun. So, yeah, this morning I've got about seven kilometers to go to get back to the car. And, uh, I have all day to do it, so I'm not in any hurry, which is nice. I stopped just now to do a change of clothes, take some stuff off. I noticed I was getting a little bit too warm and I don't want to start to sweat, not in these temperatures anyway. And had a little drink of water. So it's interesting how how much heat you can build up from when you first start and you're cold to... Uh, Do two. You know, it takes five or ten minutes before you're actually quite warm already. So, uh, yeah. Now I just have to keep moving at a decent enough pace so that with my current configuration, I won't uh, won't get cold. But, uh, yeah, I find it very interesting with camping and hiking that, especially with gear on, how almost it's almost like mindfulness you have to be mindful of you know how hot you are are you sweating uh, are you too cold and then you need to change your gear accordingly so that you can maintain your temperature comfortably and there's no risk of getting too cold or too hot so and then there's also the mindfulness of remembering to drink water, which I miss, admit I'm quite bad at. And uh, occasionally eat as well. So, okay, so here we are at one of these kettle holes. Or in fin if you translate from the Finnish name, Heden Kirno, uh, it's a goblin churn. So, folklore says that the only thing that could have made such a nice, even round hole could only have been a goblin which uh, used these for uh, stirring their porridge in. But uh, the scientific explanation is in the melting phase of the ice uh, under the glacier, you had very, very strong water currents which spun stones in place and making the stones act like drills which drilled down into the actual bedrock and then made these more or less uh, circular holes. And according to the sign, this one was already mentioned in 1890 by a 
visiting geologist and it measures approximately three foot wide and even though it's full of ice and you can't see it's actually uh, a little over three feet deep. I should mention also that uh, such kettle holes can also be found in Ireland although the ones that I know of uh, where I'm from in Cairnock Tipperary uh, are formed by in rivers where stones, small stones and gravel are spun around in, in a depression by a river current and because sandstone is so much softer than uh, the granite we have here um, it, it happens a lot faster so you can find them in uh, uh, sometimes a foot deep, sometimes deeper in, uh, in sandstone bedrock and uh, one good example of seeing those would be in the Clare Glens uh, in on the border between County Tipperary and County Limerick. Yeah, so now we're at the top of this highest point along the trail, this Kula uh, Vore place is called. Vore means mountain in, in Finnish. Yeah, uh, it's basically a solid granite hill which is sort of dome shaped because it's been shaped by glaciers so down one side is smooth very smooth granite and, and sloping quite steeply sloping and then if you look out the other side it's basically a much much rougher so uh, that tells me that the ice direction came from from there came up over smooth this hill and then continued on that direction um, usually what happens is is the ice will grind the rock smooth on the on the front edge and as the ice goes over the top it will pluck rocks away from from the back of the hill leading towards this sort of roughened roughened look uh, if I remember rightly from my school days it's called a roche motone so it's a typical feature of, uh, of glaciation and also an indicator of which direction the ice is actually moving in Okay, now I'm at the top of the observation tower, on top of this Kulavori hill. Uh, the view up here is spectacular today. I'm guessing it probably won't come out very well on the camera, which is a pity. But I mentioned previously that Finland has been rising out of the sea since the last glaciation. The top of this hill is presently 70 meters above current, current sea level, which shows you in the last 5,000 years or so, how much has come risen above the above the water. Quite quite impressive. So here's something quite typical of Finnish forests. Here of course is an ant nest. Uh, they often get to be this big. And uh, one nest like this will arrange over a really wide area with the ants bringing back both vegetation and animals as food for the colony. Just there on the side, there's some, somebody's been burrowing in there, possibly to get the ant grubs out. If I was here in the warmer months, this whole mound would be alive with uh, red ants. And they ants perform a very important function in the ecosystem because they're like nature's composters if you will. Quite impressive. You consider the size of an ant relative to the size of a mound. The sheer amount of work involved is just mind-boggling. So here's an, a large erratic and it's very interesting because right in the middle of it is a very large split. Water will seep into the crack and freeze and then expand and put stress on the actual rock itself. It'll put stress on a, usually on a fault. And uh, over time, as the crack slowly widens more, more water can flow in, freeze, and slowly but surely force the two boulders apart. It's quite neat because the actual cut or the break line is actually really smooth. It looks almost like it's been done man-made, so. Yeah, freeze thaw action. I 
back of the car, safe and sound. It was about uh, 11 or 12 kilometers altogether, and uh, truth be told, I'm exhausted. Uh, I was carrying quite a lot of weight, and my feet hurt a bit, but uh, despite that, yeah, really good experience. Quite variable landscape, great for glacial stuff and post glacial features, and uh, definitely a trail where I'll have to come and do it again. Although I might pick a better spot to camp next time. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed coming along with me for the to, for the trail. Oh, there's a needle just flew out, flew past. Okay. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed coming along with me on the trail, and uh, you're very welcome to come along with me on the next one. And I hope to see you then. Bye-bye.